Hello, everyone. Welcome to the final talk of our second Maxman conference. It's a great pleasure to introduce the director, Pavel Vlodko, the director of Davos Chris Center in Topological Data Analysis <laughs> in Warsaw, Polish Academy of Sciences, who will talk about new invariants of embedded trees and graphs. Over to you, Pavel. Thank you, Vitaly. Thank you for a very nice introduction. You, you definitely made my day. Um, so first of all, I'd like to thank the, the organizers for, 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 for giving me a chance to speak over here. It's, uh, it's always um, refreshing to, to, to hear uh, people from a different disciplines. Uh, because, you know, quite a few mathematicians do believe that the world outside mathematics is it's much bigger than the one inside. And uh, I think I'll try to, 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 to make this point over here. So I'll be speaking about uh, invariants of, of trees and graphs. And, uh, as some of you may know, I'm a TDA person. TDA is an abbreviation for topological data analysis. What we are doing is we are looking at descriptors of shapes of, of, of different objects. Um, and if you, if you ever do any type of statistics, most typically we'll be looking at the point clouds in high dimensional space. Uh, however, that's not something I want to speak about today. What I want to speak about are, uh, you know, some more basic objects like trees and graphs. In the first part of the of, of my presentation, they will be embedded into R R two, maybe R three. Um, in, in the second part, they, they, they won't be they, there won't be any embedding, so we'll be looking at the abstract networks. And uh, you know those families of trees and graphs embedded, they provide a huge variety of shapes that need to be classified, quantified in, in, in many, many cases. So, so my main motivation throughout the talk will be the neural trees, but, but I really hope that, you know, those techniques may serve as an inspiration or may, may be a tool to use some of the problems in, in, in material science. So let, let me start with a little bit of motivation. And again, we are, we are, we are coming from, from my, my initial motivation to, to work in this topic from a mathematical point of view was, um, you know, the problems in neuroscience. And if you look at our brains, there are neurons. Those neurons have different functionality, and uh, you know the, the the way neuroscientists are determining the functionality is, is, is by looking at the, the shape of neurons. So, so neurons of similar shapes, they do have a similar functionality. That that that's kind of the uh, putting the long story short. And we need to be able to to actually understand the shape of neurons in a Kind of automated way because classically it's done by by by, by using an expert's opinion. So, so that's kind of one of the first of motivations. Uh, but, but there are more, of course, looking at the natural trees or, or even structure of the veins in, in leaves, or maybe structure of the veins in human body, or maybe structure of the airwaves in, in, in our lungs. They do evolve in, in certain place of certain diseases, and we want to understand how 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 shape may be used to, for instance, to quantify, uh, you know, plants, diseases, and, uh, you know, all other stuffs. Um, I do hope that this type of questions can, can also be useful for, for people studying, for instance, polymers, joining in, in different uh, tree or graph -like, like, like, like structures. Again, I don't have a particular applications in this field, unfortunately, but, you know, maybe after today, something will come up. Um, Another application which is of interest to, to, to me is, uh, you know, trabecular bone analysis, especially towards uh, the diagnosis of, of osteoporosis. Um, again, we don't only want to look at this raw, which, which is density. We, we also wanted to look at the structure. And uh, right now we are using tools for persistent homology, but, but also, the, you know, the, the graph-like structure of trabeculum, which you can see somewhere over here, it, it may or may not be a good indication of you know, an osteoporosis in a certain patients. Um, so you no, know, that's why I think uh, looking at trees and graphs embedded or abstract is an important question that topological data analysis may or should uh, also try to answer. And um, having said that, um, you know, the, the, the kind of the, uh, the schedule for today would be to start with kind of chronologically with a topological morphological descriptor uh, and then it's generalization into short type descriptors, um, asking the questions if can be used in a more general settings and I'll try to provide some answers to this. And 
last but not least, if, if the time permits, I, I, want, I want to speak a little bit about uh, some descriptors of, of abstract graphs, abstract networks, which, which hopefully also may be useful for, um, for your community. So, so that, that, that's essentially the schedule for today. And let me start with uh, topological morphology descriptor, which is joint work with a bunch of people, mostly related to Blue Brain Project in Lausanne, Switzerland, or Geneva, Switzerland, in English. Um, so here's a, an idea. We have an embedding, embedded tree. And in really, you know, the main motivation is, 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 is a, it is a digital reconstruction of a neuron. But let's think about it in an abstract way that we have an embedding tree. What does it mean? It means that vertices and edges are, you know, collections of points in our tree. And um, we want to drag out of this some invariant which is capturing a structure of, of, of the, that particular tree. And, and for, for that purpose, what I, what I need to define first is this concept of branch decomposition. So I'll give you a rough idea first and, and, and then kind of move to an algorithm, which, which would be a constructive definition of what, what, what do I mean by that. So every branch starts from a leaf. And it is actually climbing up. So that there's an important thing which I should mention. All my trees are rooted. And that actually makes sense biologically. So every neuron have, have a soma. <clears throat> and once you, once you place a, a node of a tree close to the soma, that, that, that's your, your natural candidate for, for, for a root. So all of my trees are rooted. So, so starting from the leaves, there, there's kind of a unique direct, direction towards the, 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 the root. And uh, you know, some of the branches will uh, disappear at the branching point. Some of them will continue. I'll just provide a, a criteria which of them will stop and which of them will continue. All right, so, so that, that's um, kind of a TMD tree decomposition ones. We have a branch over here, which stops over there. There is a branch that continues all the way to, 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 to the root. And you know, we, we have all this variety of branches. How, how to make a proper definition? Well, so we always start with leaves. And uh, every single one of the leaves gets a value of some function. Um, Typically, we think about the distance from a root, right? So, so we, we want to see how far away they are. And um, once we put all the leaves into, into our list, we, we mark them as visit. And then what we are doing is we are climbing up the tree towards the root um, and taking any element from our list. We are looking for, for its predecessor, or the next element to, in, in, in a path towards the root. If this element happened not to be a branching point, we would just you know, assign it a value, the same value as our initial leaf L. And I saw that the, the, the V should be L over here. Sorry for um, the, 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 the mistake. So I'm looking at the predecessor of, of, of L, and I'm assigning it a value, which is the same as the value of L, provided that it's not a branching point. If it is a branching point at the other hand, um, then um, I'm doing the following thing. I'm checking if all the children, so all the you know, branches going out, outside, not in the direction of, uh, of, of the root, have already the value of the function assigned. And if they do, I need to pick one branch that will continue up from this branching point and the other branches we will just terminate over there. And the branch that will continue will be the one with the largest value of um, of my function. So, so, so just, just to give you an example, if, if you are looking at you know, that, that note over here, then if, if we assume that this green leaf is farther away from my root than the other green leaf, then you know, the branch starting at the farthest away uh, leaf will, will continue uh, in a given branch. And, you know, then <clears throat> we are just treating L as, as, as a Q uh, in computer science sense. And, and, and then we are kind of moving up the tree and uh, we, we do obtain this, this branch decomposition. So the, the composition of a tree into, into, into a collection of branches only intersects at the endpoints. Um, why do I need this collection of branches? Well, I needed to define certain invariant, but, but before we go over there, um, there's one important point I need to make, uh, <clears throat> namely, um, 
the branch decomposition is not stable. And stability is something we care a lot in, in, in you know, TDA computational mathematics because you don't want to sneeze on your data and get totally different invariants. So, so we want to get a similar invariant. Where there's a, the branch decomposition, so, so let us take a look at this picture. What, what does it represent? So suppose I have a tree um, which you know just have one root with the value of the function zero and two leaves. That this leaf happens to be five units away from the root, and the, the other leaf seems to be uh, 4.9 units away. And, and you know, if we really think about this data as, as something coming from, say, a computational biologist who, who did a digital reconstruction of a neuron. They might have made some mistakes. So, so, so perhaps you know this node, which is which is 4.9 away, is really 5.1. And perhaps this one, which is five units away from, from the sum, is really, you know, 4.9. And even, you know, we shift those nodes a little bit, then the, then the branches, you know, the branch that used to continue was the branch starting at the node five. So that branch over here. But after perturbation, it will be the other branch. So, so, so the, the, the bottom line is uh, what's written on the top. So that the branch decomposition is not stable with respect to any reasonable amount of noise. So you may ask, okay, why, why, why do I bother you with that? Well, the branch of composition is just a, a step in, in the construction that we want to make. So, so instead of looking at just branches, the composition, for, 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 every, for every branch, we'll actually extract two numbers. The value at which the branch starts, which you know, for that single branch will be 4.9, and the value at which it terminates, which in this case will be zero. And then every branch will get assigned a pair of numbers. So all the branches will get a collection of pairs of numbers. And, and if you heard a TDA type talk, you probably understand what I'm going into. So I really want to extract a persistent homology diagram out of this branch decomposition. And uh, even though the branch decomposition is not stable per se, if we make this perturbation, our intervals will be close, even though the branches are not. So, so, so kind of unpacking it with, um, you know, getting this information about uh, the birth and the death of a branch, uh, so to speak, uh, allows us to, to actually have something that is stable. There is a proof of it. I won't uh, actually spend too much time. I won't, I actually, I won't spend any of the time uh, on the proof. What I just want to say is that, well, that was one of the first uh, algorithms that's actually building a complicated descriptor of a neural tree. And by, by complicated, I mean a descriptor which is not a number. Because there, there are a number, large number of standard descriptors which, which assign to a tree a number of branches, the diameter, you know, all this type of stuff that you can figure out in, in 10 minutes thinking about that. Uh, in that case, we are assigning to it a, a little bit more uh, complicated algebraic gadget, namely a uh, persistence diagram. Oops, excuse me, where are we? Here we are. Um, and what, what we did, of course, was, was to test it uh, in a bunch of different examples. And in this case, we, we took uh, uh, neurons from different species compute their invariants and, and, and construct, let's say a persistence image, which is some sort of heat map that represented this, this information about where the branches start, when the branch ends for every branch of our trees. It is, it's, and as you can see from, from the images on, on, on the right-hand side, uh, you know, once we have different shape of neurons, those images are different. So uh, we are kind of able to, discriminate trees which are sufficiently different. Um, and the next question, of course, this is, this is a very pragmatic question. So, so we have those standards, uh, standard invariants for which you assign a number uh, to a um, neural tree. Can we do better than this? And it turns out that we can. So over here, we just have a, you know, a pizza, pizza pie. Uh, sliced in a you know, number of uh, different pieces and each piece consists of neurons of, of different types. And we have two types of uh, 
clustering of those neurons. So, so, so the solid blue lines are clustering make using the, this descriptor, which, which I just described to you. And the, 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 the lines, um, you know, the, this dotted, uh, I think green lines, uh, describe the result that we would get uh, using conventional descriptors, so standard descriptors that assign a number to a, a tree. And uh, as you can see, uh, you know, the TMD is in agreement with um, uh, what we expect to get, and the standard so called L measures are not. So, so it's really showing that we, we do have some added value compared to, compared to the state of the art. And th th that's kind of a good news about topological morphological descriptor. Um, but again, once you think about it, I, I, when constructing it, we, we made a, a number of kind of arbitrary choices. Uh, question is, is TMD sufficient to actually be able to quantify the, the huge variety of possible tree structures which we have, even restricting to embedded trees. And of course, the answer is, is no, because, because TMD is capturing some aspect of the structure, but, but not all of them, um, which is by far not sufficient for uh, when you look at large enough collection of trees. Um, and therefore, later on in our recent work, we, we proposed a uh, number of developments to you know, the idea which was kind of initialized with, with TMD. Um, instead of looking at one descriptor, we want to look at the number of different descriptors that every single one of them is responsible for some aspect of morphology we take about, morphology of a tree. Um, and um, that's one thing. And the second thing to, to, to make those descriptors kind of richer mathematical structure that also have a benefit in computations and classification. Uh, we want the descriptors to be a function of radia. Well, what do I mean by that? I think I can, I can move to the next slide. Uh, maybe the, the one after, so, so that will be a joint work with Reem, Salak, and Ahmed. And uh, I want a descriptor to be a function of radia. What do I mean by that? So I'm, I'm taking my tree, which, which is you know the tree that we have over here. And it's again, a rooted tree. So, so I have this, this red root, which is a special point in my tree. And I'm, look, I'm putting a ball of a radius R centered at the root, and I let R grow from zero to infinity, right? And then for every intermediate R, R I'm taking a ball centered in the, in, the, in the root of the radius R, and I'm looking at the connected component of my tree that contains the root that is contained inside that ball. In other words, I'm just you know, cutting a ball, cutting a tree with, with, with a ball. So, so, so for instance, you know, it's important to take the connected component because if we, if we take, for instance, that um, that ball over here, we, we, we have a branch that is actually coming back, uh, but it's really making a U-turn, going farther away. So we won't consider this part of a ball, of a tree, when, when considering, you know, that ball. But that's, that's why we want to intersect it and take the, the, the connected component containing SOMA. And, you know, what I will be doing, I will be computing some descriptors for every of those balls and, and see how those descriptors evolve so as, as, as a function of radii. And that's essentially the plan. And kind of the workload uh, in case of neuroscience is, is, is as follows. So, so we start from, from, from a neuron in a standard format used in the digital reconstruction. We build a binary tree, which is an embedded tree. We, we generate the short descriptors. Uh, that can be one of those, so it can be total city leaf index, flux, branching pattern energy wiring, a uh, short version of TMD or a type rate. I will discuss them briefly in the next slides, what, what aspects of morphology they, they do capture. But once we have a descriptor, it, it's really a function from real line to some metric space, right? depending on what, the, what, it, what each descriptor is, is returning us. And then there are a bunch of things we can do. So if we want to ask a question, how similar uh, two trees are, depending on, well, for, for a given descriptor, we can compute so some you know, integral distance, L1, L2, LP, if you wish, uh, between those um, functions, or, and, and then generate a distance matrix uh, that, that can be used, for instance, for hierarchical clustering, 
But those functions alone can also be used uh, for uh, classification. What do I mean by that? Well, we can vectorize them. We have some vector representation of those functions, which is, you know, typically we just take the values of those functions and a certain grid of points. Uh, and you can throw it into machine learning. You can throw it into artificial neural networks. You can do classification, you can do regression. You can do essentially whatever you like with those types of descriptors. Okay, uh, any questions so far? Okay, so let, let me move forward, hoping that you can still hear me. Um, so let me actually tell you a little bit about what type of um, morphological information are captured by, by, by those different descriptors. I'll just show you some of them and quickly discuss some others. Uh, so tortuosity is measuring uh, how the branches of neurons are winding around uh, in the space. So what we are doing is we are taking a branch, which is you know, part of a tree between a branching point and another branching point or a branching point and, and a leaf. And, and, and then, you know, we are taking the beginning of uh, this path and the end of that path. You know, the obvious thing we can do, we can, we can ask how far they were away they are in, in the Euclidean matrix. So we do it with the land of the line segment joining them. That's one piece of information, but, but another question we can ask, well, how far away they are in, in the intrinsic matrix? So how far away do I need to walk on the tree to move from one to another? And if I take the ratio of those two numbers, uh, I'll get a proxy of, of a curvature of you know, the, that branch. And um, once I do it for every um, pair of branches in a tree restricted to a given ball, then I get an average to a city. And uh, you know, that's what we are measuring. We are measuring how to, 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 to a city of the branches evolve as we you know, take balls of intersection of our tree with balls of larger and larger radii. So that, that's kind of the first descriptor. The second one is, is purely morphological. It's called the leaf index. So, so for every node of a tree, uh, the leaf index is simply equal to the number of leaves that can be reached uh, from that node. So for instance, if I, if I take this tree and restrict it to the ball over here, then you know, from every leaf, I can just get to a leaf. So, so, so the leaf index will be one. For the sum out, which is the only non-trivial branching point over here, the leaf index will be four because there, there are, you know, four leaves that, that, that can be reached uh, from the sum up. Uh, once we create, once we, and, and, and then what we are doing, we are taking an average of those numbers, right? So, 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 so we have five nodes. Uh, the leaf indices are four, one, 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 one. And we are just, dividing eight by five, just to get the, the, the leaf index at that ball. If we increase the ball, of course, um, the leaf index is changing, it, it is evolving, it's you know, So we, at the end of the day, we're getting a function from which assigns to a given radius, the, the, the average leaf index of the, the tree we are interested in. It's yet another descriptor of morphology of a tree, which is again motivated by, by, by standard descriptors. Uh, the next one we are looking at is what we call the flux. Um, so once, once you have a tree and, and the ball centered in the radii, in, in, the, in the root of the tree, you can actually check how you know, the branches that are intersecting uh, the surface of you know, the boundary of a ball or, or a sphere, how far away they are from being you know, radi radial. Right, so how far away they are from, from uh, going into the normal direction in the sphere. And you know, the average number, the average angle we are getting over here will be, will be the value of the flux for that particular radius. And again, we are moving, um, we, are, we are allowed R to grow and then see how, how this number evolves. So, so it's also telling you something about the, how radial the structure is in a sense. And then there, there, there is more. We have a branching pattern, so which is essentially the number of bifurcations minor just number of leaves for this re every restricted tree. We can define, <laughs> that's yet another definition of energy. We can define some electric field and we can compute the value of it. The electric fields by, by putting electrons in the, 
branching points of our trees and uh, see what, what's the what's the charge in some points of our space that, that can be another invariant. We can look at the total length of the tree and see how it evolves once, once we are looking for larger and larger trees. And we also have the short version of TMD, which is you know, just doing this standard topological morphological descriptor, but for every ball of every different radius. And you know, in that particular work, we also consider the taper rate. So neural tree is very much like, like, like the standard trees that are growing in the, in the world. They have this tendency that if you are moving far, farther away from, from, from the root, then the branches are getting thinner. They're moving closer, they're getting thicker. Uh, you can also measure how fast the, 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 this process uh, progress as you move away from the root and that's something taper rate will, will be capturing for you. Okay, so, so what I'm saying to you is that the amount of different trees and graphs you may have embedded to our free that's a, that's a very, very big and complicated beast. Uh, and to kind of manage it, I'm proposing to, to look at large collection of descriptors, uh, hoping that when they work together, we'll be able to capture the complexity and being able to tell apart the subtle differences between you know, different collections of trees. Uh, therefore, that, that list is by, by no means uh, finalized. Uh, but what do we want to do? We want to use those descriptors to compare different trees or maybe different collections of trees. Um, how to put them together? Well, there, there, there are a number of ways to do it. If we have an expert knowledge and, and, we, and we know that certain um, morphological feature may be important, then we may want to find a, a descriptor that is actually responsible for that feature. And, um, just compare the trees. Uh, again, there, there, there are two ways of doing it. You can run classification by, by vectorizing the obtained function. Or you can look at the distance matrix and uh, which is obtained by, by computing the, the, for instance, a one distance between the, the, those functions and um, do the clustering analysis on, on that discrete metric space. And the, the, the examples I showed you on the TMD uh, best classification of neurons of, the, of, the, of different species are just examples, of, you know, just computing at distance and um, um, looking at the differences between uh, different collections of neurons. So that, that's the option one. That's, that's kind of a lazy option, but, but we do have an alternatives. Uh, these two of them that I will present. Uh, so somehow the idea of having a number of descriptors is to make them work together and, and to show the power when working together. Um, uh, so, so how we can do it? And he, 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 here's one of the suggestions that we, we may follow. So suppose we have a collection of neurons that contains two types of neurons. Like so, so we have neurons of the type A and we have neurons of the type B. Um, we look at, and different descriptors. Each descriptor gives rise to a distance function, as, as we kind of informally defined so far. But what I can do is I can combine those distance functions with the weights alpha one all the way to alpha n. And um, obviously everything will depends on the weights. How do I choose them? Well, over here we are suggesting to, to, to select alpha one and alpha, all the way to alpha n from n-dimensional grid. So we are looking at you know, a number of different options for alpha one, a number of different options for alpha two, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, for every possible combination of those options, we are computing an index which tells us how, how different those two different classes of neurons that we want to separate are. And uh, once we find the best uh, ensemble of alpha one to alpha n, um, as I call it an optimal weights, uh, we have you know, a metric that is discriminating our classes of neurons as, as best as it can. Um, we also have a way of interpreting it. So, so by looking at the, the values of alpha one all the way to alpha n, uh, we can get an information which descriptors are important in telling those uh, two collections apart. So, so, so we can also uh, infer some knowledge well, 
is this type of analysis. And of course, as you probably notice, well, when I'm giving myself the freedom of choosing uh, a range of alpha one or all the way to alpha n, then I'm getting into a procedure which is exponential with respect to n, not n factorial, that's just an explanation mark. Um, so we need to be a little careful with this approach because we have a large number of descriptors, then we are getting into a real, real troubles. And a possible way out of this would be to use uh, metric learning. And that's the, the standard technique in um, you know, learning theory, machine learning. Uh, and the setup is exactly the same as we have before. So, so suppose that we have, a, for simplicity, a collection of uh, neurons that kind of decompose into two types. So there are two, two, two different labels. And uh, what we can do is to define this, this distance. And it's, I, I'm always very stressed when I have to read it. So this is Mahalo Nobis distance. I will not say it again. I will call it M distance from, from now. Uh, so the idea is, uh, first of all, I'm taking my, my data points. So, so what I need to do, I need to vectorize my functions, embed them into Rn. And once they are embedded over there, what I want to do is I want to find a linear transformation, which is, which is this M matrix, which is called L over here, just to, just to make the things a little bit more confusing, um, that transform linearly my space. But you know the purpose of metric linear learning is to transform it in the way that you know, objects of my two classes are as separated as possible. So that's, that's something that metric learning is doing under the hat for you. Again, by looking at the, the entries of this matrix, we can get a little bit of information on uh, you know, which morphological descriptors play the role or do not play the role in uh, discriminating um, the two, collect, two classes. Excuse me. Okay, any questions so far? I just want to make sure that you can hear me still. Yes, yes, it's okay. Okay, good, thank you. You know, it's always this, this strange feeling when you're speaking to, to a computer and wondering if it's still connected. Okay, <laughs> so, so, so we, we, we have those collection of three invariants which is growing as we speak. Um, they're all household stable. So, so again, it means that if you take a tree which is in a sense close um, to, to, to your other tree, we are, we are actually using an extended notion of stability, but you may really think about household type stability. Uh, Um, then we can combine all together. Every single one of them is, is, is providing us, is working as a weak classifier. But, but the hope is that when they are working together, we are getting a strong classifier, so to speak. And then here, so some of the results. Um, so we are looking at a different collection of neurons, like, like Purkinje interneuron or um, Gagolin cells. And um, you know, using L measures, or TMD alone, or Torturo City alone, or branching pattern, or flux alone, uh, gives you a reasonable classification. Uh, I, I think flux is actually doing a fantastic job over here. Nonetheless, once you combine them together, you are really seeing, as, as we are doing over here, you are really seeing a, a picture in which the classes that you want to be separated are really separated. And, and you know, it's, um, I think over here is just a standard linear combination. So we are not using any of the, of the optimization techniques we mentioned yet, but it's, you know, the, the, the purpose of this picture is to show that once, well, once you have a way of looking at different aspects of morphology, you make them work together and you're getting good results. Um, to kind of show you the, the, the results of metric learning or grid type approximation, um, here, so, so we, over here, we are looking at uh, five different collections of neurons, and uh, we are we are taking an embedding of those in, into some high dimensional space, and then and then uh, we are using a stochastic neighborhood embedding technique to project it down into two dimensional space. So if you, if you project it down as as, as they are, uh, we are getting the classes, which you know some of them are separated, but but there is a lot of overlap. In the middle. However, if we apply metric learning in this high-dimensional space, 
transform it linearly, and, and then to do the, the stochastic neighborhood and bending again, we are getting almost perfect separation of those classes. And that, 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 that also is showing a power of uh, metric learning once you have a labeled data and a reasonable descriptors to, to operate on. And that's, uh, you know, that is also, of course, reflected in the results of classification, which is something I'm not showing over here at the moment. Okay. Uh, Okie dokie. So, you know, the biggest handicap of uh, the biological assumptions which, which were guiding us uh, when working with neurons is um, there are essentially two of them. First of all, we, we, we have a luxury of having a well defined uh, root, which is the soma. And secondly, uh, we are working with the trees. And uh, if you want to work with polymers, probably they will form a, a structure, which is a structure of a general graph. Um, is there anything we, we, can, we, we can do about it? And um, again, that has not been tested. So those two slides are that this one and the next one, which I will be showing to you, are, are kind of speculative. But what I believe we can do is we can still choose a meaningful uh, candidate for a root by doing something like taking an average of the coordinates, uh, which in this case would be, you know, let's assume that, that the red point is the average of the coordinates. And then I can look for, 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 for node in my tree, which is the closest one, and just declare this guy a root and, you know, do the construction starting from, from there. So, so, so I think that there should be a way out of, you know, rooted trees into, into general trees. That, that, that's kind of the long story short. Um, in case when you have an embedded graph instead of an embedded tree, uh, but I, if you actually go through the set of uh, invariants, you realize that they are not using that much the fact that we you are working on the tree. They are mostly using the fact that, uh, well, you have certain structure, sorry about that, uh, and they can be generalized to work on general graphs. Uh, for those of the invariants which cannot, well, well, what you can do is simply to, to consider a collection of spanning trees, uh, rooted them, and uh, carry on your analysis. So that's the hope. This, so I, I do hope that those, those techniques generalize. And um, so far, I didn't have a good data set, good motivation from applied science to test it. If you if you have one, I would be more than happy to talk to you and then try to try to move this this path. Um, but before we move, what I want to do is um, to get rid of the assumption about the embedding. And also what I want to do is I want to check how much time I have. Um, so let's see. Okay, uh, Vitaly, can I go for five more minutes, please? Yes, yes, yes. It's okay. Uh, so what I want to do is I, I, I want to stop talking about uh, embedded trees. I, I want to speak about abstract trees, abstract graphs. So if you happen to have any questions about the embedded trees, uh, maybe you would like to ask them now before I move to something uh, a little bit different. So I'll give you five more seconds. Oh, so I had some questions on your um, embedded trees, but maybe it's, it will be easier if you discuss at length if you have five Absolutely. Minutes. OK. okay. So let, 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 me, let me just then jump to, to speak a little bit about abstract networks, and then, then we can have a proper discussion. So in this setting, what we have is just an abstract graph. G equals collection of vertices and the collection of edges. Uh, no proper embedding. Can you construct a meaningful invariance? There are some of them, of course. You know, in degree, out degree, average degree, and you know, all the obvious stuff that you may think of. There are some topological invariants in work by Grigory and et al. from Bielefeld. Um, but you know, what, what they are doing over there is they, they have very case by case definition, which is very hard, at least for me, to, to, to manage. And therefore, what, what, we, what we want to propose in this work with, uh, with, with Sadok and Ahmed is um, to provide a clear, simple, powerful, and functorial construction that assigns a graph a certain poset, uh, and then perhaps a homology of the posets as well. So that, that's something I'm going to define right now. OK, so if I have a graph, 
an abstract graph, well, you know, there are not that many things that I can do, but I can define a path. And the path will be just a sequence of um, constitutive vertices. What I mean by constitutive is that they are connected by edges. And so that there is no repetitions, right? So, so that's really a simple path, not a loop. And what I can do is for a given graph, I can consider all the paths up, up to a certain length and they do form a posit structure in the natural way. And what do I mean by that? Well, if I have you know, an abstract graph, which I visualize over here, um, you know, there, there is a path of the length three consisting of vertices one, two, and three, which corresponds to this element of the poset. But, but if I actually make this path a little bit shorter by removing the first vertex, I'm just getting a path to three, which, which is you know, an, an, another path of the length at, at most k. Um, or I can shorten it from the other side uh, by removing the vertex three and just get the path one, two. And by doing this, I'm getting this binary tree or poset type uh, structure uh, that kind of describes the, the relation and let, let, me, let me say the layout of, 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 of the paths in my graph. Okay, so, so, so I have a poset, but so I had a graph, I, I, have, I had constructed a poset which is way, way bigger than it. It's, it's still an abstract graph. It's, it's a kind of a binary dime. So that doesn't change my situation too much. But you know, what we can do is um, we can build an order complex. So, okay, maybe the first obvious thing to do is uh, we can just look at the number of paths of the length one, which is you not know, just number of edges, number of paths of the length two, which are just you know, the number of edges which are you know, connected to each other, number of paths of the length three. It gives, it spits out a vector that kind of characterizes the structure. And that may be one of the invariants that we may use, but that's not the only one. We can actually go ahead and apply homology theory by using a standard construction of an ordered complex of a poset. So here's the construction. So if I have a finite poset, I want to create an abstract simplicial complex based on it. And I, I do apologize, I didn't put a definition of an abstract simplicial complex. Let me just tell you what it is. So it's a collection of sets, finite collection of sets, finite collection of finite sets, such that if I take any set of this collection, any subset will belong to this collection. And you know, every simplicial complex you heard about is a particular instance of instance of these abstract simplicial complex structures. So what is my abstract simplicial complex? Um, so the vertices of that post set, they will correspond to vertices uh, in my simplicial complex. What will be the simplices? Well, if I take a chain of comparable elements, so for instance, one, one, two, one, two, three, that chain will be a simplex. It will be a two-dimensional simplex. For instance, if I take one, one, four, and four, that's not a chain because one and four are not comparable in my process. So and therefore that this will not be a complex. So I can only construct a complex kind of moving up into, into, into my process, into ordering of, that, of this process. And here's an example of a simplicial complex I'm getting uh, from the structure. So for instance, if I start from a vertex four, I can move to vertex two, four, and I can move, move to vertex uh, four, two and three. Uh, there's a chain of comparable elements and uh, I'm pretty sure that that's the, the corresponding two-dimensional simplex. So again, I have this two-dimensional simplices. I can create yet another characteristic vector by, by just counting the number of dimension zero, dimension one, and dimension two simplices, dimension three and four. If my, 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 my poset is, is, is larger, that's another possible invariant, but, but yet another invariant would, would be the Betty numbers of, of the homology of, of that complex, if I actually apply a homology function. So, so there are different levels in combinatorics on which we can, we can define a possible invariance of such an abstract networks. Question, is it good for something? Well, yes and no. And let, let me give you a few examples for no and then a few examples for yes. So, so, you know, there are those uh, network databases and then we just took a free um, examples, uh, free data sets from this database. One of them, them is EM, IMDB. So if you think about, you know, Friday night movie, then probably you can, you can use this database to, to search for a, a nice movie that you may want to watch. Uh, but somehow they, they made it uh, 
a um, rough structure. You, you can look at it over here. We can actually run this machinery and in some classification tasks, we are getting 70% of accuracy. Uh, comparing to the state of the art, I mean, the state of the art using most neural networks is beating us a lot. Uh, likewise, for a protein data set, again, I won't be speaking about precisely what the data set is. We are getting an accuracy of 72%. Again, the, over here, what I'm listing is the accuracy using different uh, classification methods. State of the art is 84. So again, we are beaten. We are using only one aspect though. So sorry, I want to make it clear. We are using one aspect of, morpho of uh, morphology of the network. However, if, if you look uh, far enough, look at, for instance, and the enzymes data set, we are getting 93% classification result in this particular classification task. And this time we are beating the state of the art by, by far, which the state of the art seems to be 78% in opposed to 93% accuracy in our case. Of course, we are doing proper cross-validation, et cetera, et cetera, everything, every standard thinking machine learning. Um, and you know, it's, it's kind of a nice spin out, out of this research. So I mentioned various invariants you may, you may attach to your um, trees. Number of paths of different lengths is, is one of the examples. And what I came up with, I, I really, when I first saw it, I, I, saw, I realized that it's a very nice way to teach people, kids, combinatorics, graph theory, and um, so I, I created the, this, this thing, which is called the Game of Trees. At the moment, you can go to my YouTube channel. You can, you can just go to YouTube, type Pavel Wodko Game of Trees. You will see that video that explains how to play the game. And soon we'll have the game on iOS X and uh, Android. So if you are you know, traveling to work um, using a public transportation, you may be able to play a little bit with those types of invariants on the screen of your phone. Um, you know, that, that's, uh, I'll let you know as soon as that, that, that appears. And I, I do apologize for running over time. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Pavel. Let us thank Pavel, our final speaker at the second Max Min. Thanks a lot. I'll stop.